we're actually entering a new section, part 12. It's entitled The Death of Christ. And I hope, I hope everybody's okay with this. We're going to review, like we have in the past, each time we've entered into a new section. Uh, again, one of the things, one of the benefits of doing a study of the life of Christ is just to get a framework as you read through the Gospels on your own, just to have an idea of where you can slot things uh, through Christ's life and ministry. So I've tried to group these where they're easy to remember. I don't necessarily expect you to be able to recite them, um, but I've grouped them in such a way that at least it made it easier for me to remember. What is the very first of these 13 major periods in the life of Christ? John the Baptist. No. Um, introduction to who he is. Okay, preview of who Jesus is. So that one kind of stands alone. And again, we're talking about John's gospel, the first chapter, even talking about the pre-incarnate Christ and uh, who he is and was and, and how he came. And it does talk about John the Baptist as his forerunner. Now, after that, it's three groups of four. So the first one, I think, is relatively easy to remember as long as you remember another person in addition to Jesus. Who is that? John the Baptist. So can somebody list off the four elements in that next group? And again, think, think sequentially, think chronologically. Birth of John the Baptist, or the early years of John the Baptist. The beginning ministries, the ministries, the ministries, ministry. Okay, so we got another birth before we get into oh, the birth of Jesus. Christ. Okay, so you have the early years of John the Baptist, the early years of Jesus Christ, ministry of John the Baptist, right? The public ministry of John the Baptist, and then the ministry of Jesus. Okay, so you got the end of John's ministry and the beginning of Christ. Again, just think about John the Baptist and kind of what his association is with Jesus. Uh, he was born first. And also, his public ministry began before Christ, necessarily, because he was the forerunner of Christ. All right, so the third group of four, well, it's the second group of four, but the third in the 13 periods, has to do with, what's one key word that you can remember to kind of remember what all four of these relate to? Oh my goodness, it's been a long time. <laughs> it has been a long time, and that's why we're reviewing. Plus, Ministry? No, the ministry would be more the second group. Okay. It's really the third group is about. No, not not as far as the titles. It's more about geography, right? It's the, oh, the ministry Judea. of Christ in Galilee, the ministry of Christ <laughs> around Galilee, the later Judean ministry of Christ, and we call it later because we've already had a year down in Judea, uh, in the beginning of his public ministry and then the ministry of Christ in and around Perea. So in each case, there's a geographical area associated with it. Again, kind of think chronologically of how those go together. So what's the last four all about? One particular period in the life of Christ. Denise. I'm cheating. Yeah, well, that's okay. <laughs> well, this isn't is. really it. This is no, the other not. thing. So that's this right. is different. I'm having but, to surmise. But you can look at that one. But it's all the final... The final week? That's right. It's all about the Passion Week. So you have the formal presentation of Christ and the resulting conflict. You have the prophecies and preparation of the death of Christ. That's what we've been covering for the last several weeks. You have the death of Christ itself. And then you have the resurrection and ascension of Christ. So again, I think if you, if you think about the way these are grouped, and again, it takes review and work, but it will help you remember these. Now, what we're going to look at and start looking at today is the death of Christ. It's a relatively short section compared to what we've been looking at for the last several weeks. It includes the betrayal and arrest, a six-phase trial of Christ, three by the Jews and three by the Romans, the actual crucifixion, and then the burial. Okay? So this is the chart that Denise was cheating off of. Uh, again, it's a helpful tool to... Help you think through the three-year ministry of Christ in particular. It starts with his birth. We have the birth narratives in both Matthew and Luke. We don't have a lot about the childhood of Jesus. What is the one exception to that? 
Um, when he went to Passover week to go to learn with the ministers. Very good. So he comes down with his family. He deserved Passover. He's 12 years old. And he is sitting there interacting with the learned men of Israel. And they're astonished both at his ability to answer questions and those questions that he asked. Again, we don't have much between the time of his uh, of that event and the time that he launches his public ministry at about 30 years of age. <clears throat> his opening ministry is in Judea. Uh, what kinds of things take place in that first year of ministry? We, we, we're saying on the chart, it's relatively obscure. Again, that's largely in comparison to how popular he's gonna become in his second year. But what happens in that first year? The wedding. Okay, the wedding in Cana of Galilee, his first miracle. That actually takes place up in, in Cana of Galilee rather than down in Judea. What else? What launches his public ministry? Baptism. His baptism by John the Baptist. What happens when he's baptized? Yeah. The Spirit comes down upon him, and that really is what empowers him for these three years of public ministry. Uh, what else happens during this first year that is really significant? The temptation. Okay. Immediately after he's baptized and the Spirit comes upon him, he, he's impelled by that Spirit to go out into the wilderness and be tempted. That's a really important uh, record that we have in the Gospel accounts of Jesus' fitness to be the Messiah, the fact that he's able to overcome those temptations. Anything else that you can think of in the first year? He, cleanse the he cleanses the temple. He's going to do that again at the end of his three-year ministry, but that's a very significant event that happens. And you can imagine the kind of controversy that would have stirred up. Who is this guy? I mean, he comes out of this backwater of Nazareth, and he's coming down here and cleaning out the temple. He hasn't been, uh, you know, hasn't come under the teaching of the Pharisees the, the way that all of us have. So you can imagine the kind of uh, controversy that created. There's a couple of other things that happen. And again, this large, this first year is largely recorded for us only in John's gospel. What else, Kathleen? Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees. That's right. A Samaritan woman, which would classify as a Gentile? Well, she was a mix, Jew and Gentile. That's what made her Samaritan. But that's the two that I was looking for. In the interview with Nicodemus where he came to Jesus by night and significant interaction there. And then he makes, starts making his way up from Judea up to Galilee, passes through Samaria. He uh, first talks to the Samaritan woman at the well and tells her about her past. And she comes to recognize him as the Messiah. And then she ends up, along with Jesus, uh, evangelizing her whole village. All right. You can see that the obscurity is starting to pass away and... Uh, he's becoming more well-known in his second year. What happens in that second year? Where does he go? Galilee. He goes back to Galilee, and he's going to be up there for about 14 months in Galilee proper, and then still in that area around there. And what is the, what is the thrust of his ministry? What's he doing? Healing people. He's healing people. What is that? What's the purpose of his healing people? To verify who he is. To demonstrate who he is. And and who is he? God. The Son of God. He, he's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he's proclaiming the nearness of the kingdom, just like John the Baptist said before him. Remember, he came at one point back to his hometown of Nazareth. And at first, they're marveling at the words that are falling from his lips. But in just a little while, they're ready to throw him off the cliff. I'm right Daniel's prophecy made them think that this was about the time he would arrive. And every Jewish mom was kind of hoping their child would be the Messiah. So, at least, I think the latter statement is true. They were looking for Messiah. They knew that uh, at least 69 of the 70 weeks that, that was coming close to an end. Um, I, I don't, don't like the exact year, but they're like getting very expectant yes. that he could come. I think that's fair, largely because of the different Gentile kingdoms that had already come and gone, and now they were in the Roman Empire, and they were looking for a Messiah to come. You had that 400-year period where there had been no prophet from God, and John the Baptist is the one that interrupted that. 
certainly there was an expectation built up after John came and said that he was, you know, that the Messiah was coming, that the kingdom was near. Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure. Frank, the, min the ministry of John the Baptist, that called in all the believing remnant. It called in the hope, believing remnant that as was... Well, as well as made the Sanhedrin <coughs> check it out, see if it could be the, the Messiah. Yeah, you, well, you certainly had some Pharisees that were coming out to be baptized. Remember what John the Baptist said to them, who, flee, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? So it was, I mean, John the Baptist, we talked about him. He was very uh, hearty character. and uh, He was calling it the whole country, but certainly the ones that had uh, were already holding to the hope of coming Messiah were already believers the believing remnant, like you talked about, they would be the first to come, I would think, but there would be others to come as well. So I was reviewing that, and it says that G John was doing what he was doing so he could point out the Messiah. That's right. He was doing the work of preparing the way for the coming of Messiah. <clears throat> so, Obviously, Jesus, because he had this power to heal and because of his very authoritative teaching, remember, while he's up in Galilee, he preaches a sermon on the mount. He preaches a message largely to the 12 as he commissions them to go out and do the same kind of things that he was doing. He also delivers the um, mysteries of the kingdom. So there was lots of opportunities to hear him teach. And he's just growing in popularity. Uh, he chooses the 12 at this point in time, right after that's when he preaches the Sermon on the Mount. But there's a certain point at which he leaves Galilee, not forever, not for good, but he starts going into the surrounding areas to preach. And at that point, we're entering into the third year of his ministry. And what is his focus there as opposed to what he did in the second year? Preparing his disciples. Exactly. He's chosen the 12. He's, they've already been learning from him over the course of his whole ministry, but he's really focusing on preparing them and also bringing them to the conclusion themselves and the conviction that he was indeed the Messiah of Israel. Remember, when they get to Caesarea Philippi, uh, that's when Jesus asked them about who, who do they think he is. And Peter's the one that says they are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So... <clears throat> That's for the first half of the third year. And then the concluding ministries, he's back down in Judea, particularly for the Feast of Tabernacles that John's Gospel talks about. And he's also in the surrounding area of Perea. I'll show a map that shows these areas. And then we get to the, the last month and a half is where we are now in our study with the triumphal entry, the events of Passion Week, basically. I apologize, I don't remember. Is when Matthew 12, when the... Pharisees um, blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Is that in the second year? When is that? It is in the second year. Okay. Uh, because right after that is when he goes the, to teaching in parables. Yes. So that happened that year. That's right. And somewhere during the, the last half of that year. Okay. That's when he starts telling the disciples in one way or another that he's going to have to leave and die and do. So that's not till the third year. The year. Yeah. He, he brings them to the point of confessing him as the son of Israel, I mean the son of God, king of Israel, and only then does he start talking to them about the fact that he's going to be delivered up, killed, and rise on the third day. So that's really interesting, right? I mean, we think about um, the death and resurrection of Christ as central to the gospel <clears throat> for us, and it is. But he didn't start talking about that with the twelve until he's in the third year of his ministry. And he's talking about the kingdom up to that point. He's going to keep talking about it after that. But uh, that, they didn't, they didn't, we, we understand better now why they didn't understand that Christ had to die. Do you think he did that because he didn't want them to focus? He wanted them to focus on what he was teaching them rather than... If you know somebody's going to leave or somebody's going to die or whatever, you kind of get <clears throat> one tract on that and you get kind of get obsessed with that if you will so i think he, he knew that if he told them that in the beginning they would well, maybe not paid attention to what he was teaching them that may be true but i think he told them that in the beginning because that was his message uh, in the same way that john the baptist before john wasn't preaching the death of christ he was preaching the coming of the kingdom 
And they were very familiar with that from their background in the Old Testament, right? They had this history that had a series of kings that ruled on God's behalf. And they also had this prediction that uh, eventually the nation of Israel would be restored. So the kingdom that, that they're talking about, both John the Baptist and Christ, is based on all that prophecy in the Old Testament. It was only after they reached the conclusion that Nietzsche mentioned about the Israel saying that he did what he did by the power of Satan and not by the power of God, that things started to change. And he started introducing these parables that talked about a new phase of the kingdom that wasn't foreseen in the Old Testament. And of course, that included his death and resurrection. That's not to say that, you know, he knew that he was coming to die. I, I understand that. But that wasn't the, the thrust of his ministry for the no. first two years. <clears throat> okay, so... Let's look now at it geographically again. I want you to just be really familiar with this map. He, of course, he's born in Bethlehem of Judea. He ends up being raised in the city of Nazareth. Uh, his public ministry, the first year, is back down in Judea for the largest part. He does go up into Canaan of Galilee to perform the first miracle. He ends up, after a year, leaving there, going up through Samaria, evangelizing the Samaritan woman's village. He ends up in Galilee for about 14 months. Where does he go after Galilee? He goes around Galilee, and that's in the areas, more Gentile areas of Tyre and Sidon, uh, Decapolis, and then it's, it's at Caesarea Philippi that he uh, brings the disciples to the conviction with Peter being the spokesman for them, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So after that, he comes back down uh, he ministers in both the areas of, well, he's back down in Judea, and this is where the later Judean ministry of Christ takes place, particularly at the Feast of, Feast of Tabernacles. He ministers in Samaria and Perea. And then there's a certain event that happens in Bethany that changes everything. Or I shouldn't say changes everything, but it's a very significant event. You might know what that is. Does Jesus raise Lazarus? Very good. He raises Lazarus, and the Jewish leaders all of a sudden acknowledge that he is the Messiah, right? No. No. <laughs> what is it they, they want to do? Him. They want to kill him. Yeah. Because <laughs> both of them. Yeah, they want to kill both of them. Jesus, because he's starting to do, well, he's even raising people from the dead, and they're afraid that they're going to take away their nation and uh, the religious leaders' authority. They want to kill Lazarus because he's evidence that he's raised somebody from the dead. So Jesus leaves, leaves Bethany. He goes up to Ephraim and then back up through Samaria. He goes up to Galilee just for a short period of time, basically to hook up with the other pilgrims that are coming down for Passover. And then he makes his way back down to Bethany. He's back in Bethany at this point because that's where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived. So that's the big picture overview that we've done. <clears throat> this is the city of Jerusalem where all the events of Passion Week take place. He's staying out in Bethany. You can see the... Let me get my pointer here. Here's the road to Bethany here. So Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live right over here, about two miles away. And we talked about how he comes in on this road for the first three days, <coughs> uh, at least the first, yeah, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, the first day he comes in is the triumphal entry. He comes on into the temple and heals the blind and the lame and then goes back out to Bethany. The second day he comes in, there's a fruitless fig tree that he curses. And he uses that <coughs> as an illustration of Israel's coming judgment. He also uh, turns down the request of some Greeks to see him. Uh, and we, we believe that's an indication of the nearness of his crucifixion resurrection and the fact that the gospel is not going to go out to the Gentile world until after that takes place. What happens on Wednesday? I'm sorry, on Tuesday. He comes back into the temple and what takes place on Tuesday? When does he the temple again? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. When does he? He cleanses the temple. Is that Wednesday? Is that Monday or Tuesday? I think it's Monday. Okay. Tuesday is what hap What else happens on Tuesday? That's when, he answers questions. that's when he answers questions. The religious leaders are really trying to find something that they can charge him with that will stick 
so they can take him to the Romans and have him killed. Um, that happens on Tuesday morning. What happens on Tuesday afternoon? Yes. The fig tree. The fig tree was uh, earlier. Yeah, I'll bet discourse. So he's had this difficult confrontation with the religious leaders on Tuesday morning. Well, I'm trying to give you all kinds of hints. Yeah. I thought you were he's going back here. by the fig tree. I was he's like, out. no. He's over here at the Mount of Olives. It's a really good view of the city of Jerusalem. And he starts talking about the events that are going to precede his second coming. Okay, what happens on Wednesday? Judas makes arrangements. Judas makes arrangements. We really don't have much of a record of anything that Jesus and the twelve are doing, but we believe that's the day that Jesus makes arrangements to ultimately betray Christ. No, I'm not cheating this time. Um, they didn't want to kill him on the, on the Passover, right? Why? Uh, You're talking about the religious leaders? Yeah, because the crowds would be there. And that was the main thing. They didn't want to do it during the feast, but because of the, the crowds. Now they end up doing it on Friday. So they're kind of, their hand is forced, right? God is kind of, God's making them do it when he wants it done. It, everything's after, operating on God's timetable to be sure. The main thing that they were concerned about as far as the crowds, they knew how popular Jesus had become and they, they feared a revolt, but they ended up doing it during Passover week anyway. You know, Frank, I was just thinking that when, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That's when the religious leaders were like, okay, he's got to die. That's right. Well, so, you know, the Jewish people were familiar with prophets all through their history. <clears throat> you know, prophets raising people from the dead. Elijah did it, right? <clears throat> but I wonder why they think, because think about Elisha, who wasn't it him who um, called the she bears out of the woods to eat the children that mocked him? Was that Elisha or Elijah? I get it. I, I always have our time. It was one of them. I think it was Elisha because Elijah. he was coming back from right. Elijah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and, and I only mention that because, you know, they had this history of that is a prophet, and obviously they acknowledge he's a danger because he's just raised a man from the dead. But, I mean, that took a lot of nerve to say, well, then we. Clearly, he must die. Did they not fear retaliation? This man can raise people from the dead. Well, remember, the prophets got treated pretty badly, too. Well, they all did. That's yeah. true. <laughs> so, but their own people did. That's right. They killed him, right? That's right. They did. <clears throat> yeah, their own people did. And and Jesus talks about that, right? In one of his discourses, he talks about, you know, you're the same people that, that killed the Old Testament prophets. prophets. Yep. There's a certain kind of people within the Jewish nation that really hard rebellion against God and they were just following in that wake it is really strange though that you had a man that had that kind of power even the power to raise people from the dead he's proclaiming the nearness of the kingdom and the fact that he is the king and they want to kill him and even kill the guy that he raised it's just it's like one of the biggest kind of women punching him in the nose it is and, and in fact that's what they did and, and they paid the price for it right so we get to Thursday, and you remember what happens on Thursday evening? Preparations for Passover. That's right. Late Thursday afternoon, towards the evening, they start making preparations for Passover. We think this is the upper room, or a probable location for the upper room, where they celebrated that Passover. Uh, the Lord also instituted the Lord's table there. Uh, the commemoration that we celebrate is death and resurrection. <clears throat> Um, and then he starts in these into these discourses that are recorded for us in John's Gospel, John 13 through 17. At some point, they get up to leave the upper room. We're not sure if he finished all the discourses or if he starts making his way through the city, perhaps towards the temple. But eventually, they cross the Kidron Valley over into the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where Jesus prays these three agonizing prayers, genuine Request that if there be some other way for this to happen and redemption to be secured, please let this cup pass for me. What's interesting though is you, you, you hear the agony in his voice as he's praying these prayers, but for the rest after this, uh, he is strengthened unbelievably. I mean, he's very bold uh, to do what he has to do for the rest of Passion Week. Sometimes he, he just remains silent as they're questioning him. But when he speaks, he, he's without fear at this point. <clears throat> hey, Frank. 
Yes. He remains silent, right? Because he, he's going to be, that's predicted in the Old Testament. He will not, he will not say, he could get himself out of that. Legally, he could have gotten himself out of all that. But he didn't do it. Well, he let himself go. I don't know if he could have done it legally. Well, they but had, he could definitely have done it. Yeah, what they were <clears> accusing <throat> him of was not true. That's right. And they, they were violating, <clears throat> they were doing it under the cover of darkness. Um, so we're going to get into that this morning. Uh, a lot of what they did was kind of even against their own standards. Uh, but they were in that much of a hurry to make sure that he was put to death. That had something to do with not having a dead body so that the Passover feast could continue? Well, they, they took his body down from the cross in haste and put it in a tomb uh, because they they didn't want it up there for the Sabbath. And then you, that's why the ladies come back on the first day of the week to better prepare the body for burial. I don't think they wanted any of the bodies up there. That's why they broke the legs of the other two, but they wanted them to die. I don't think they wanted to have anybody on, on that dirt for that pastor. For the, yeah, for the Sabbath in particular. For the Sabbath, yeah. I mean, because technically they were on the, there for Passover <clears throat> Friday. Right. It started Thursday evening. Mm hmm Okay, so I don't know if you saw the last circle. Uh, it's a possible location for Caiaphas' house. We're going to meet Caiaphas in our study this morning. Uh, he was the official high priest at this time. Annas was kind of the former high priest who still had a lot of sway and influence. But so once he's going to be arrested here in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then we're going to end up back down in this general area for the trial that takes place at Caiaphas' house. So that brings us to where we are today. Uh, we're going to start in John, John 18, beginning in verse 2. After deciding to put Jesus to death, the Sanhedrin, which was like the Supreme Court of the nation of Israel, represented by the Pharisees and the chief priests, called upon the Romans to go help them arrest Jesus. Now, we talked about this some last week. John's the only one that mentions a Roman cohort. But you can imagine, why would they want to take the Romans out there with them? They're not, they're not allowed to, um, I don't think, arrest or put anybody to death without without the Romans' permission. They couldn't do it. It was okay. the Romans' way to do it for them. So they definitely couldn't put anybody to death, and that's why they ended up having to go to the Romans and talk to them about having him crucified. They could have conceivably, I think, gone out and taken Jesus into custody, but what what's the possibility if they do that? The people would revolt. Okay, well... Part of the reason they do it under the cover of night is the crowds don't know what's going on at this point. So that's why Jesus took, Judas took the opportunity he did. He knew where Jesus was likely to be, and he goes out there to get him. But think about this. I mean, you not only have Jesus, but you've got 11 others that you've got. You don't know how they're going to react to this. And we see that Peter even took out a sword and cut off the ear of the slave of the high priest. So they go... Over, overpowered. They go with more manpower than they, need, than they need to make sure that they're not going to have any trouble. Now, a Roman cohort is normally 600 men. They, the same term is also used for a detachment of 200 men. It's, I don't think it's likely that they took 600, but 200 is not outside the realm of possibility. And again, they did it just to make sure that they're going to be able to take Jesus into custody without an issue. So let's read there. Beginning, John 18, beginning verse 2. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, that is the place of the Garden of Gethsemane, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. So that term, officers, is talking about Jewish officers that helped guard the temple or had administrative function in the temple and even guards for the chief priest himself they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons now you got to keep in mind it's dark uh, they don't have street lights the way we have them today so they had to have these kind of things they're going up the side of a mountain and, and into a garden where there's not a lot of light Jesus therefore knowing all the things that were coming upon him went forth and said to them who do you seek they answered him Jesus the Nazarene he said to them, literally, I am. 
Now, you see that phrase appear a lot in John's Gospel. We've already talked about the connection that it has with the name of God from Exodus 3.15. It would also be a way of acknowledging that. You're looking for Jesus? I'm, I'm him. And Judas, who was betraying him, was standing with them. When therefore he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, why would they do that? That's the name of God. Okay, it's the name of God, but these are Roman soldiers. I mean, that was God saying his name. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I mean, he did this before, right? Earlier in John's Gospel, and they didn't necessarily fall to the ground. Uh, he's, he told them at one point, before Abraham was born, I am. So he's doing it to show them he's letting them take him? I don't, I don't really know why they fell to the ground, to tell you the truth. I'm just saying... Uh, well, you remember there was a point earlier in John's Gospel where the Pharisees had sent folks to arrest Jesus, and they came back and said, what did they say? They, they didn't arrest Jesus at that time either. What did they say? No, they were still like him. Exactly. Let me read that just to give you a little more of the context. This is in John chapter 7. Many of the multitude believed in him, and this was after the resurrection after the raising of Lazarus, I believe it was. And they were saying, when the Christ shall come, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? The Pharisees heard the multitude muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. I don't think this is Lazarus. This is a different situation. But later in chapter 7, he says, there arose a division in the multitude because of him, and some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers, therefore, came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, Never did a man speak the way this man speaks. So, at a minimum, we could say that they, uh, they recognized to some degree the, his authority. Uh, when he said, I am, he said it without fear, uh, and it caused them to, to stumble initially. Obviously, they're going to end up arresting him anyway. I've, I've always thought for a long time that they were falling down at the mentioning of the name of God, but I'm not sure that the Roman soldiers would have had that kind of background well, or they, even that kind of reverence. They didn't have reverence. Like, it looks like it was forced on them. I mean, why on earth would the Roman soldiers, and they didn't like kneel down. It says they fell backwards. Yeah. So, I mean, it's another one of those cases too where they could have done more than they realized. You know, they, they may not have recognized fully that this was God in the flesh. I don't even think the 11 did at this point. But their reaction, at least at, at the point at which John writes this, he's intending to show that he is God and that he's, uh, that that was the kind of reaction. I know I'm not explaining that very well, but uh, to me, it's, we're, not, we're not told why they fall. Uh, and it's just a bit of a puzzle. <clears throat> Yes, it, it's all. It just seems like any time humans came in contact with a celestial being, like when they saw the angels, they would fall flat on their face. At the uh, at the road on Damascus, when even Jesus, as a spirit, came and talked to Paul, the others all fell, you know, fell on their. I mean, fell on their face. So, like any time they came into some contact with celestial being, that they just it was but, some kind of overwhelming force or something that. Yeah, but in this case, you know, Christ is not glorified at this point. He's not, um, he's in the same body that he has been, and there have been people all around him up to this point where he's not, they've not fallen down in that way. So that's what makes it uh, intriguing to me as to why they did at this point. Andrew? Do they assume it's an ambush? He's coming at us because they have more followers than we thought? And they're falling back in a military sense of, oh, it, it could be, it could be something like that. I mean, they, the fact that he was uh, unafraid to say who he was, they, they might have thought something was going to happen next, and they're falling back in, for that reason. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus is going to go on to say, look, I'm the one that you're looking for. Let these other guys go. But it, it could be simply that they were afraid that, that he was... Obviously, they know about this guy, right? He's done... He's had a public ministry for three years. They've heard it. Probably some of the same soldiers that came when they were trying to arrest him before. And... They might think, okay, this guy's fixing to zap us now. This is a huge crowd that, that can fit in there. The, the, what can fit in there, I mean, I'm not saying it's 600, but it's a huge crowd. 
and they all fell back. Not just the ones up front that could hear them. Well, Something then, made them all. I mean, normally when you step back, you step on toes, unless everybody steps back and falls back. It doesn't say all. Oh. It says, when therefore he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So I don't know. I don't know how many of them did. Uh, I don't even know how many were there. Um, it was a large contingent of men, probably more than you would suspect, to arrest one guy. Maybe they tripped over each other. Is it possible <laughs> that they stumbled? <laughs> but you know, it, the there does seem to be it's something it's in response to the statement. <clears throat> of his identifying himself. I think we can say that safely. I don't think that they, rec you know, that they heard the name of God and they fell down in awe and worship of him as God. No, not in awe and worship, but his power and fear. as God and fear of, for awe. Was, is clear. He had just another example of how he had control over the situation. Oh, he could have stopped look. them and he left them. Oh, for sure. There's no question that that was true. He knew everything that was going to happen to him. He had already warned the disciples about these things happening, and he, everything was playing out exactly as he anticipated. But the fact is, they get back up, right? And they addressed him. So he the that's right. <clears throat> Again, therefore, he asked, "Whom do you seek?" And they said, "Jesus of Nazareth." And Jesus answered, "I told you that I am. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way." that the word might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Of those whom thou hast given me, I lost not one. Remember, that was Jesus himself saying that back in John 17, his high priestly prayer. Um, and, it, and this is just another fulfillment of that. The fact that he not only was going to keep them eternally in salvation, but he's keeping them even now in an earthly sense from being killed, from being captured. That's Let's switch over at this point. And, and for these events, it's especially helpful to have the harmony because you see things in each one of the accounts that's not in the other. <clears throat> Let's switch over to Matthew 26, being in verse 48. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign saying, whomever I shall kiss, he is the one, sees him. Uh, John doesn't record this part, but Matthew tells us. And immediately he went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. Now, if you look over to Luke's account at this point, it says, Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what was happening, or what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? Now, you might normally think, well, Peter's the only one that took the sword out and cut a guy's ear off. But they were all ready to do that. And again, I think that goes to the fact that they thought they were convinced that Jesus was Messiah, and it was really difficult for them to understand how he's now being arrested and going to end up dying. They still did not understand why that had to happen. It's only after the resurrection that that's going to change. Jesus said to Judas, Friend, do what you have come for. And then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Now that's not a blanket statement to say that war is wrong. Uh, God himself was the author of war in the Old Testament. But in this case, uh, defending Jesus by sword was not the way that was gonna happen. And uh, like Kathleen said, things were happening the way that they were supposed to. Jesus ends up actually healing this fellow, and that kind of quieted things down. And here's a good point, too, that uh, in verse 53, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? And that he at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. A legion is 12,000. We've already seen from the Old Testament what one angel could do, and this, this would be a 1,000 per man that was out there with Jesus in the 11. He's just saying... Yeah, he could get out of this if he wanted to. He doesn't need Peter's help to cut the guy's ear off. How then shall the scripture be fulfilled that it must happen this way? At the time, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and you do not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. So on the one hand, He's protecting them. On the other hand, 
they're deserting him. And he told them that that was what was going to happen up front. Just as a side note, Luke, who was a physician, is the only one that mentions the healing of the fellow who had his ear cut off. Luke uh, 22, 51 says, Jesus answered and said, Stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Okay. Now we go to the first of, of three phases of the Jewish trial. And this is at the home of Annas. <clears throat> Again, Annas had been the high priest up until 15 AD. He was, he was deposed by the Roman government. And Caiaphas, his son-in-law, took over in 18 AD. Annas was the one probably still regarded as the official high priest of the Jews. Remember, from the Old Testament law, the high priest served for life. So there were probably a lot of them that didn't uh, recognize the fact that Caiaphas had taken his place. Annas was also uh, had multiple sons that had served in the high priesthood before. So he still, still had an awful lot of influence. So they took him there first. Let's read about this first phase in John 18, verse 13. Relating to Annas first, for he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. And Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. Remember when we read that earlier in John's gospel? This was the context where Lazarus was raised from the dead. This is in John 11. Many, therefore, the Jews who had come to Mary and beheld what, what Christ had done believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, uh, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it's expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. Now, obviously, he spoke more than he realized, right? And John says this as much. Now, this he did not say on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. He didn't mean that when he said what he said. He's just saying, look, we can get rid of this whole guy and we can keep our nation. But he spoke by God, by the Spirit of God in prophecy, and said that one man was going to die for the nation in the sense of paying the price of their sins. And then John goes on to write, verse 52, not for the nation only, but that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they plan together to kill him. Okay, back now in John 18. <clears throat> Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Who do we think that is? John. John, good. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. So even though the 11 had been scattered, there were still a couple that were following closely, John and Peter. <clears throat> Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. This guy not only was known by the high priest, but evidently was even willing to grant John's request that Peter be able to come inside as well. The slave girl, therefore, who kept the door said to Peter, you're not also one of these, this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. That's, that's Technically, Peter's first denial. Now, we, we're going to come across a harmonization issue because John puts the first denial in the courtyard of Annas, and he records in his gospel three different denials of Jesus. The other gospel writers also record three denials, but all three in the courtyard of Caiaphas. So what are the possibilities there for harmonizing those two accounts? <clears throat> well, that Caiaphas and and Annas were related, possibly, so they could have been their same. The home of the father was also the home of the son. Okay, good. Beverly actually brought that up to me, and I'd not <clears throat> thought about that before. But it could have been a com common courtyard, you know, the way that they built houses, and you see it today sometimes in schools, universities, 
where you built four different wings of a home and the courtyard's in the middle and you could have Annas on one wing and Caiaphas on the other. As you read the accounts, it's clear that they leave the home of Annas and go to Caiaphas and you know they just refer to the same courtyard in one instance as being Annas and one as Caiaphas. That's one possibility. Any others? Could they have just, the others just placed them in the other, just to show they happen, but they're not being as particular about location? Does that make sense what I'm saying? Not like they're being dishonest, but just, yeah. they're just kind of merging it together in a sense? Yeah, I don't, I mean, if they are in two different locations, the gospel writers definitely have their three in, in Caiaphas courtyard. So to me, the, the other possibility is there are actually four denials, and that doesn't violate prediction that he would deny him three times before. In fact, he, he would. He not only denied him three times, he denied him four. But either way, uh, this first one happens while they're at the trial under Annas and then they're going to eventually go to Caiaphas' house and all the gospel writers have denials there. John has two, the other gospel writers have three. And he says before the cock crows three times, could this have... Two times. Two, two times? You were denying him three times. That's right. But that doesn't leave out other times. No, that's right. There now, have been other times that he would as well, but the cock crowing is what would trigger Peter's memory. That is what triggers Peter's memory, and that is the end point of, regardless of how many denials that you count, he doesn't, he doesn't deny him again after that. Remember, after that, he looks at Jesus, Jesus looks at him, and he goes out and weeps bitterly. All due respect, Frank, I, I disagree with your the fourth the fourth denial. Uh, I, the reason is that once Peter denied him the third time, immediately the crow the crow. Or the, okay, so that's the, and, and, or the, the that's the third time, crowed. according to three or two of the gospel the writers. Crowed, yeah, and and he knew he immediately remembered that Christ said he will deny me three times and he knew that was the third time well that is what christ said he does remember that that's for sure i still don't think that that necessarily precludes uh four denials in the same way that when you read one gospel account it talks about two angels and when you read another one it talks about one being at the tomb so all i'm saying is that you know, christ didn't say you'll deny me three times and then only three times he no. said you'll deny me three times before the cock crows and it's possible that you could have done more than three there's some commentators that, as they look, and this is an issue as you look at the different accounts together, some come up with six denials uh, based on the people that are, just, are questioning Peter because those differ according to the accounts as well. But all I'm trying to do at this point, and uh, no offense. I, no, 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 yeah. you know. no, I don't mind you questioning that because it, it is a question. Uh, You've got to come up with some way to harmonize the fact that one of them happens at Annas Courtyard and the other happen, the other three happen at the, the most logical one is, like you said, that back in, especially back in those days, families pretty much stayed yeah. together. Yeah. Father, grandfather, I mean, multiple generations, just like indigenous people here, you know, 100 years ago, you know, they stayed in the same, you know, yeah. general. And I think you can make a strong case for that, even by the things that take place in the courtyard when they're warming themselves by a charcoal fire. And then that takes place in both accounts. Mm -hmm. And also, the fourth one is not necessarily in the same category as the three. <clears throat> the three were, they were literally questioning him. Our, you know, he had witnesses, people were standing there, and she was witnessing against him. Whereas the gatekeeper girl is just saying, What do you want to Yeah. It could be like a totally different category, of, not like a testifying, yeah. but a, you know what I'm saying? But they're, as we look at the other ones that take place, it's the, the same kind of language of, surely you're one of the disciples because your same accent language, gives you away. There's, there's an audience. Yeah, I think there's an audience in all three places. Oh, you think so? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just think there would have been other people around coming into the courtyard or coming into the house. David, did you have that? What would press me more toward Beverly's courtyard would be the, the restoration in the end of John there with the three restorations. That's a good point. So. Yeah. Again, that would tie with his prediction of three. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm becoming more that, convinced the common courtyard. I just think the cop, <laughs> I just think the cop crowed at, on the third time, and it doesn't make sense that he would continue denying him after that because he was so guilt-ridden. No, that so he, I'm not he saying cried that. bitterly. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that there was denial after the cop crowed. All of these took place before the cock crowed. Right, but the cock crowed kept... precisely at the, on the third time. That's when he wept bitterly. Well, the third time in, in the gospel writers that's, that only mention three, it's when you combine the accounts that you yeah. get conceivably a four. Because each one of the gospel writers individually only talk about three times. Mm -hmm. So, and I just say that to say, don't be surprised when you put the gospel accounts together that you have to resolve some of these kind of things. And it, at first it can be troubling because you don't come across this kind of thing uh, if you're just reading the individual accounts. But there's there's ways to harmonize it, and the common courtyard is a good one here. Uh, I just warn you about that as you read the harmony together. Okay. Verse 18, now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold. They were warming themselves, and Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest therefore questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? What's the implication? Hey, I'm not hiding anything. There's plenty of people out there that you can talk to to hear what I uh, taught. And you're asking me, you're not even asking other eyewitnesses or ear witnesses of what Jesus said. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. Behold, these know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers, and again, this is not a Roman officer, this is a Jewish officer of the temple, standing by gave Jesus a blow or a slap, saying, is that the way you answered the high priest? Can you think of another incident similar to this in the New Testament? Paul. Paul. Yeah. That's right. Now, Paul, he apologized. He does apologize because uh, I think he says he didn't realize he was high priest. Yeah, he didn't. But he, <clears throat> he had something to apologize for. I mean, he pretty much insulted him, called him a whitewashed wall. Jesus <laughs> doesn't have anything here to apologize for, and he doesn't apologize. He says, if I've spoken wrongly, bear witness of the wrong, but if rightly, why do you strike me? <clears throat> Well, it's, it's obvious that these people had a bias. They were on a mission to to do to you know get him accused and crucify him and all that. And sometimes you know you see that too in law enforcement, bad, the bad elements of law enforcement, where they zero in on one suspect and they ignore sometimes some of the other witnesses or things like that that could be either. Um, add to the, the guy's guilt or maybe give doubt to his guilt. Yeah. But they just kind of zero in on one. They were on a mission to zero in on they, Jesus. They were on a mission. They were running out of time. <clears throat> They're not going to take time to run out and no. get witnesses right now. They're just trying to find something that they can charge Jesus with. And keep in mind, they've got to charge him with something that the Romans are willing to put him to death for. Mm -hmm. Their issue with Jesus is theological. The fact that he's claiming to be the Messiah and they don't believe he is. The Romans are going to have to have something more than that to put him to death. And that explains why Pilate was so reluctant. And we're going to see when we get to the Roman phases of the trial that they change the charge that they make initially as the Jews and, and, and change it to something that they think the Romans will embrace um, and basically accuse him of insurrection. It also says that they were questioning about his disciples. To be intended to protect him. Yes, he has protected them already. And, you know, he told the people that were arresting him to let them go, and they did. And didn't they break their own law by doing this at night clandestinely like this? And so, so didn't they used to have, like, trials in the open where yes. people could participate? Yes. Yep. And, in fact, they're going to do that here. <clears throat> They've already made up their mind, but oh, yeah. after the sun comes up, they're going to have another trial just to make it legal. Yeah. Now, there are people that... <clears throat> They take issue with that and they say, well, those rules that you're talking about really developed much later in Jewish history than in the New Testament times. But but they mentioned it there, though. That's how I knew about it. They mentioned it. Don't they mention that the, they were, the trials were supposed to be during during the, the I day? I don't think they mentioned it in the gospel accounts. 
I don't know how else well, they would. I don't know how they would have learned it if it wasn't in the Bible. <laughs> the Bible. Well, the Jews developed all kinds of stuff that was outside of the yeah. Bible, and so there are rules and procedures for trials. The argument is that it developed like second century rather than during this period of time. They also weren't supposed to make him turn himself in like that either, right? They were supposed to have witnesses. They were supposed to have witnesses. They weren't supposed to depend on him. They weren't supposed to slap him and stuff and make him confess. Well, they weren't trying to make him confess here. But they were slapping him. I thought that this was a trial. It was supposed to be a fair trial. The Jew, that's what they were famous for, these fair trials. Yeah. And I think you had to have witnesses, and you, you couldn't condemn yourself. So we, we need to keep going, because they are going to try to get witnesses. The problem is they can't find two to the degree. <clears throat> but let's keep reading. Second phase is, so they, they end up leaving Anna's house and going to Caiaphas' house. And at least part of the Sanhedrin is here for this trial. Now, all of them are going to end up being as part of the third phase. Um, but it's still very early hours of the morning. It's doubtful that the whole Sanhedrin was there for this part. This is at the home of Caiaphas. This is in Matthew 26, verse 57. And those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. He's the official high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. That's part of the Sanhedrin. But Peter also was following him in a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and he entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus in order that they might put him to death. Now Matthew is characterizing it as false testimony. Obviously, they're not trying to, they're trying to come up with something they think will stick. They're not seeing it as false. And they did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward and said, this man stated, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Did Jesus say that? He did say it. Technically, but he was talking about himself. Okay, so that's the point. He was talking about himself it wasn't clear that he was talking about himself when he said it, even in his own context. But that's the, they remembered that, and they can use that at least for a charge that will make it stick for the Jews. And that was from like three years before, right? Like that yes, he said it was that a early. long time ago. That's right. It, it was. It's in John chapter 2, I believe. Uh, Mark, Mark's account says, We heard him say, I'll destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. But not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. And the high priest stood up and said to him, Do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. It's a, a way of putting him under oath. That you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right, <coughs> excuse me, at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's a quotation both from Psalm 110 and Daniel 7. Well, at that point, I mean, Jesus has kept silent up to now, but now he said this in front of the council. Um, and they, they feel like they got him dead to rights now. Then the high priest tore his robes saying, he has blasphemed, which would be true if he wasn't the son of God, but he was. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you've now heard the blasphemy. And what do you think? They answered and said, he's deserving of death. Then they spat on his face and beat him with their fist and others slapped him and said, prophecy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Also, the other accounts talk about the fact that he was blindfolded, or maybe that's later but that for them reinforced the idea that he wasn't the Christ because they were able to do that kind of thing to him and nothing you know at least initially nothing happened to them now Peter's denials come that was the second phase that we just talked about at least in the harmony this is where they come after uh, the visit to Caiaphas and before the final phase of the trial um, let me just read through these quickly. I know we're getting close to the end of our time. But we'll see the, the three of these, three denials. Two of them are to slave girls, and one is to a man who's standing by. I think I'll read out of Luke's 
account. We haven't read much of him this morning. So after, it says, after they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the firelight, so she got a little better look at him, and looking intently at him, said, this man was with him too. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. And a little later, another saw him and said, you are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. The man there is actually, and again, if you're comparing the accounts, that second one was also a servant girl. So you say, well, how can you call her man? Well, it was a, a neutral form of address to a stranger. It could work for a man or a woman. It, it's, it's a woman there in 58, and then down in 60, it is a man. It's just a translation issue. After about an hour passed, another man began to insist, saying, Certainly this man also is with him, for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. Immediately while he was still speaking, a cock crowed. So again, this was at, at the end of all the denials. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, Before a cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. And the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him and beating him. And here's where they blindfolded him and were saying, were asking him, saying, Prophecy, who is the one who hit you? So now we come to the third Jewish phase. And this is before the Sanhedrin. Um, and this is after the sun comes up, continuing in Luke's gospel. When it was day, the council of elders of the people assembled, assembled both chief priests and scribes, and they led them away to their council chamber, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe, and if I ask a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, Yes, I am. And they said, what further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. <clears throat> so that's the three phases of the Jewish trial. They ultimately get what they're looking for as far as something that they can charge him with. Uh, they're going to have to change that charge to make it stick with the Romans. But at least now, in their minds, he's claimed to be the son of God, and they don't think that he is, so he's blasphemed. Next week, we'll look at... Uh, first the remorse and suicide of Judas Iscariot and then the three phases of the Roman trial uh, that take place after the Jews bring him to Pilate <clears throat> okay I know we went a little longer I appreciate your patience and good interaction good questions let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed happy Mother's Day to all your mothers hope you enjoy the rest of your day and don't forget about the picnic next week I don't I said dress casually, but maybe not too casually because we may do a picture. Would right. that work? Okay. So just bear that in mind. <laughs> All right, let's pray together. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for Christ's resolve, for his firmness, for even when he's under the a heat of intense pressure, he's speaking with authority. He's not denying who he is. And he is uh, doing this despite the fact that uh, his followers have scattered. And he knows what's coming as he makes this profession. He's enduring their beating, uh, their mistreatment of him, even though he's completely innocent. And we thank you that he did that all the way to the cross. And that he conquered sin and death <clears throat> through the cross and through his resurrection. We thank you for this opportunity that we'll have in the weeks to come to uh, to look at this again and to be uh, encouraged and refreshed by the fact that Christ died for our sins that you made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him Lord I pray for our mothers that you would give them a, a really enjoyable day today with their children and I pray that you bring us back safely next week to enjoy worship together and enjoy celebration of our fourth anniversary as a church we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.